Hello and welcome to Catholic Christianity. In our first episode, we talked about the truth about truth, science and God. And we discussed this issue of whether it's reasonable and valid to say, well, that's true for you, but it's not true for me. We looked at the question of whether science disproves religion and disproves the existence of God. And we looked at the question of if there is a God, is it possible to know who that God is? And we looked at two kinds of revelation, two kinds of ways that God reveals himself to humanity. The first one of those was what we call natural revelation, where we can see God by his works, by the world that we live in, by the universe. We can see God's existence in humanity, and we'll unpack some of these reasons in just a moment. And then the second kind of uh, revelation was when God does something special where he reveals himself in a certain way that we would not have known unless God did that. And so we see that right through scripture and it culminates in the person of Jesus Christ. And we'll explore that in a later episode. But today we're going to look at natural revelation reasons for God. So the kind of reasons for the existence of God that do not require religious faith. They're philosophical, they're logical, uh, but they're not based on scripture, they're not based on the tradition. And so no matter where you are situated, you can listen to these reasons and make sense of them yourself without having to be religious. Now for Catholics, uh, they can, they, and for Christians, of course, in the, the broader Christian tradition, these reasons can help to you know, solidify your faith and give you confidence. But for those who don't have faith, it might just give you some reasons to start to take religion a little bit more seriously. Now, before we get into three natural revelation reasons for God, let's just take a step back for a moment and recognize something before we get into, into arguments or reasons. And that is that you and I are people. And because we're people, we are not impartial. We are not robots who literally just take in information as it is and then apply it like we're programmed to hear something and then do. We have a predisposition. And so even now, as you're listening to this talk, you're weighing up what you think of me, whether you think I'm worth listening to, whether you like the way I look. If you're like me, you're probably looking at the books on my shelf behind me. And you're making up your mind about whether or not you're going to take what I say seriously. And this is normal. That's what we do because we're people and we're not robots. We don't just take in information um, as it is. We are not impartial. And this means that as we work to discover truth and we try and find out what is real, we have to try and move beyond our own subjectivity and, and move beyond what we would like to be true or what our personal preferences are and have an openness to discover the truth no matter where it leads us. Now, one of the people that had the best insights into the, uh, the notion of human predisposition or our subjectivity, the way that we come to understand and believe something, was a, a philosopher from the Middle Ages called Blaise Pascal. And he wrote this great little book, I'll grab it. It's uh, called The Penzais. It's full of like one liner um, and short paragraphs that are, are fascinatingly insightful. And before we get into these arguments, I want to look at four quotes from Blaise Pascal. First of all, he says, people almost invariably arrive at their beliefs, not on the basis of proof, but on what they find most attractive. So what we see is that when you come to these arguments, these reasons, before you're even open to listening to them, something that um, has an impact on how you hear them is whether or not you find them attractive. So do you even find the notion of there being a God, a transcendent being beyond time and space, is that attractive to you? Because if it's not, um, then you'll struggle to hear reasons to the contrary. A second quote from Pascal, we are generally persuaded by reasons we discover ourselves rather than those given to us by others. And so again, I'll be giving you some reasons today, but that might just encourage you to do a bit more research yourself because if you discover these things yourself, you're more likely to accept them than if they're just downloaded from someone else who's telling you um, new arguments. Third quote, we know the truth not only by reason, but by the heart. And so no matter how strong the arguments that I share with you today might be and how reasonable and logical a belief in God might be, if your heart's not open to the possibility of God, 
you're going to struggle to hear them anyway. And the last quote from Pascal, he says, In faith there is enough light for those who want to believe and enough shadows to blind those who don't. Before we get into this uh, conversation about arguments for the existence of God, what do you want to be true? What would you like to be true? Because when it comes to this question of faith and of, of the existence of God, our will has a huge impact on our ability to see God. It has an impact on faith, and our will is going to have an impact on how you hear these arguments that I'm about to share with you. If there's an openness to the possibility of God, these arguments will take you forward. But if you really do not want there to be a God because it's going to be too much of an inconvenience to you, you'll struggle to hear these arguments and to hear the logic in them, even if they are reasonable. So with that said, take a moment just to pull back from, these, uh, from the logical discussion and go, what's my predisposition? Before I listen to these arguments, am I open to the possibility that there is a God and I, am I open to the possibility that these arguments might actually be persuasive and might lead me somewhere? And if the answer is yes, then you're probably ready to hear them. If the answer is no, then you're probably going to spend the next 20 minutes debating in your head with everything that I say. So, having said that, let's look at three arguments for the existence of God. Number one, intelligent design. This is the argument that just basically looks at how we normally think about anything that we find. And what I mean by that is, imagine you know, you're know you out on a cruise ship and the cruise ship runs aground in the middle of the Indian Ocean and it lands on a, at a, uh, an island that looks to be deserted. And so everyone jumps off, piles off this cruise ship and they get out onto this island and you're walking around the corner of the beach. You know, there's always the sort of beach and then there's the rocky alcove and then there's, there's the next beach. And as you walk around the next corner, you see up the beach, there's a shack that's been built along the tree line, a single shack. Now, when any normal person sees that shack, there are a whole bunch of assumptions that are immediately made. You look to that shack and you assume that someone has been to this island before, that you are not the first person there. And you assume that that person or people who have been there have built that shack and you assume as well that there might actually be people there. Why do you make all those assumptions? Because you see intentionality and intelligence in the development and design of the shack that's on the beach. You don't assume that there was an incredible storm that washed through the past the island and snapped all the palm trees up and by some form of miracle chance turned these trees into a shack. Nobody would think that that is a reasonable explanation for how the shack got there. Now you could do all kinds of illustrations and I'll just give you one other one. Imagine you've never seen art before um, and you've never been, you know, seen pictures of, of Europe and the art that's on the walls in Europe and you stumble upon a painting which is the very famous to us all Mona Lisa. Now, when you see that painting, once again, you make assumptions immediately about that painting. You look at it, you see the intelligence, the cleverness in it, the unusual nature of that painting, and you can see that there has been a painter who has very carefully created that piece, no matter how small it might be. So you assume, once again, like the shack, that because of the intelligence in the effect, there must be intelligence in the design and therefore an intelligent designer, an artist who was clever enough to paint the Mona Lisa. So I've given you two examples that show us that in ordinary life, when we find something new, we make assumptions about it based on what it is. And when we see intelligence, we assume an, assume an intelligent designer. Now let's take that concept and apply it now to the universe. The universe is full of design. You can just take even the human eye, for example. Now, I'm no scientist, and a scientist could give you many other examples, but I'll just give you two. The human eye needs about a million connectors to join onto a million connectors in order for the human eye to see. Now, that is intentionality, and it is design. 
If the Earth were a single degree further away from the Sun, it would be too cold for, for us to live. And if it was a single degree closer to the Sun, it would be too hot for us to live. So we see then design and intentionality in the uh, relationship between the Sun and the Earth and what that creates in terms of an environment that can sustain life. So that's just two examples, but what they tell us is that there is design all throughout the world, all throughout the universe. And because there is design, we can assume an intelligent designer. And it's actually reasonable to think, well, obviously someone's designed this, an intelligent mind has put this together. And so when we think about who or what that intelligent designer must be, the answer to that question, of course, is God. And so the argument about intelligent design is basically, if there's intelligence in the effect, there must be intelligence in the cause. We see intelligence in the universe, therefore there must be an intelligent designer. You might have heard uh, people like Richard Dawkins say things like, well, isn't that just God of the gaps? Isn't that, we don't know the answer to this question, so aren't we just filling the gaps? And, you know, isn't that just something that faith is projecting onto this situation? Well, let's just address that for a moment. Think about the alternative. Let's take God out of the picture. There's intelligent design right throughout the universe. And we're going to say, okay, there's no intelligent designer. All of this intelligent design in every aspect of the universe is all chance. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that that answer, that it's all chance, that it's all fluke, it's all, you know, just an amazing um, coincidence, actually requires far more faith and far more stepping out on a limb than it does to recognize the possibility of a transcendent being, a God who is intelligent, who has designed the universe. So with that, it can, be, it can actually require more faith to believe that the universe with all its design is here with no God than it does to just recognize that probably there is a God who is um, that intelligent designer. So that's reason number one. Reason number two, let's keep moving. The second reason is first cause. That is to say, everything needs a cause or an explanation. This is the principle of sufficient reason. Um, I'm wearing this jacket, which you can see, of course, and this jacket didn't just all of a sudden appear on me. I didn't walk down into my office and pshaw, there was the jacket. You, again, look at my jacket and you make assumptions about the jacket. You assume that I've bought it from a shop somewhere, I've taken it to my home, and I just so happen to be wearing it today as I share this presentation with you. So when you see a thing, anything, you assume something about where it's come from. The fact that I exist means that you can assume that I have parents who had parents, 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 and it goes on and on and on. What we find is that we as humans make assumptions on the basis of something's existence. Because it exists, we assume it came from somewhere. Now, at some point, you've got to track these causes right back. You know, we can, can, we can track them generationally. We can track my jacket and where it came from and where it was designed and where it was created. We can track my own genealogy in terms of my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents and all of that. But eventually you get to a point where where did this come from? How did this start? And when we think about the universe then, where did this come from? If everything has a cause, what is the initial causer of the universe that we live in? You see, even uh, science tells us that if there is nothing, something cannot come from nothing. I'll say it again, something cannot come from nothing. So how do we explain how this world came into existence? And now there's you know, plenty of theories about the Big Bang and evolution and the, the you know, thousands, millions of years, whatever your preference is. But the question you have to ask yourself is even if you, um, you, know, you take the Big Bang theory, who started the whole thing? Who made the bang happen in the first place? There was nothing and then there was something. How do we explain that? So what we find is that the fact that the world exists requires a reason or a cause, something or someone to start the whole thing off. And that something or someone, that transcendent being, that power beyond time and space has to be self 
sufficient. That is, they don't have a cause themselves. They don't have a creator. They didn't have a birth because they've always been. And so when we think about the universe, the fact that it exists, and then the fact that it needs a cause, it needs something to bring it into being, then who is that causer or what is that causer? In the Christian tradition, we would say that is God. Now I come back to my uh, last argument where I explained that it takes more faith to to recognize all this design and say it's a chance than it does to recognize a God. And I think the same is true with first cause. To say something came out of nothing, but there's no transcendent being to make that happen. It just, there was nothing and then there was something. To remove God out of that picture, in some respects, arguably requires more faith than just recognizing that perhaps there is a God who's a transcendent being who brought all of this universe, the world as we know it, into being. So number one, intelligent design. Number two, first cause. Our third argument is entirely different. And this is an argument that, again, it was, it was written by Pascal, who uh, I've been quoting earlier in this talk. And so, you know, he's, he's from the Middle Ages uh, period and so has a particular view around God and heaven and hell and all those things. But he makes the argument that the belief in God, just from a straight betting perspective, is a wiser or a better bet. So this is what we call Pascal's wager. Wage up the options, which is the better one. He says uh, belief in God is a better option. And this is why. He says, imagine for a minute, there's two options. One is that there is a God. The other is that there isn't a God. And so you confidently decide to say, I'm gonna believe that there isn't a God. If you die and it turns out that you were right, there is no God, there is nothing to gain right? You're dead. You can't even tell anyone that you were right. You're annihilated. There is no future. That is the end. So there's nothing really to gain. You've just died. But if you choose to reject the notion of God um, and you say, no, there is no God and you're wrong, then that can have internal implications for you. And so you've got something to lose if you're wrong and nothing to gain if you're right. In contrast, if you believe in God, and you're wrong, you've got nothing to lose because you just did anyway. You can't tell anybody that you're wrong, but you did. But if you believe in God and you're right, then you've got all eternity with God uh, to gain from it. So Pascal would say the belief in God is a better bet because you've got everything to gain and nothing to lose compared with a belief that there is no God, so an atheism. He says it's a worse bet because you've got nothing to gain and everything to lose. So if you just look at, at it from a betting, from a which is a wiser option, that would help us to say, maybe I should be open to the existence of a God. Now that argument in and of itself is not really an argument for the existence of God. It's an argument to say it's a better bet, right? But the power of that argument is that if you're a very confident atheist, who has spent much of your life believing this, proposing this, and reading books by atheists to fortify that belief, an argument like Pascal's wager can just help you stop for a moment and go, maybe this is not the wisest road to take. And of all the things that we know about the world, if you think of everything humanity knows, we actually know very little. And we're finding out new things every day. There's new discoveries in science all the time, theologically, philosophically, we continue to learn. And so this body of knowledge, if, if all we have to, to, all that is possible to know fills this whole room, we might have this much. And so this confident assertion that there is no God is a very courageous one. And it, it actually uh, requires a heck of a lot of faith because we don't know enough to categorically make such a statement. And in fact, as the arguments that I've shared with you today suggest that it's quite possible and even probable that there is a God and that's notwithstanding uh, the, the human religious experience of God, which we'll talk about in a later episode. So three arguments for the existence of God. Number one, intelligent design. Where there's, a, where there's intelligence in the design, we assume an intelligent designer. Just as if we saw a shack on a desert island, we would assume that someone's been there first and they've built that shack. We wouldn't think it was an accident or a surprise storm that created a shack out of timber. And in the same way, we see the design of the universe and there we, therefore we assume 
and intelligent designer who is God. Argument number two, first cause. Everything comes from somewhere and there has to be at some point someone that caused the world to begin. We know that something cannot come from nothing. And so it's a reasonable thing then to, to think that there must be some kind of transcendent being who doesn't have a beginning or an end, who is self-sufficient, who started this whole thing off in the beginning. And number three, Pascal's wager. It's a better bet to believe in God because you have everything to gain and nothing to lose compared with not believing in God where you have nothing to gain and everything to lose. At the beginning of this talk, I said in faith, I quoted Pascal, who said, in faith, there is enough light for those who want to believe and enough shadows to blind those who don't. And so remember, it's not just a good argument that's gonna convince you. It's also the desire for the possibility of God. And it's a desire for what is the truth, no matter where it leads. And so my hope is with these three arguments that they might just help move us along the spectrum of belief in God to recognize that there are indeed reasonable and logical reasons to believe in a transcendent being. We're not talking about a, a sky daddy in the clouds, an old man with a big gray beard who floats around judging people. We're talking about an all powerful transcendent being who is creative and inf infinite and who can bring the world into being, design it with intelligence and give us the beauty and wonder of the world we live in. So two thoughts in our final section where I like to leave a challenge for us. The first one is this. I've given these arguments of first cause, intelligent design, and Pascal's wager. Take a moment to, to notice these things. When you're out in the world, when you look at a beautiful sunrise, recognize the intelligent design in the fact that we as humans can sit here and see the beauty of the world in front of us. Recognize God in those moments where we see in front of our own faces the intelligent design of this universe. It's amazing truth, it's amazing beauty, it's amazing goodness. Secondly, think about the cause. Where did this all come from? How is it possible that this has come to us without a God? The whole world speaks of a transcendent being, an intelligent designer who caused this thing to happen. And finally, if you're struggling with that as well, Think about those two options and the fact that maybe there's wisdom in the consideration of the possibility that there is a God. Final point, and this one's particularly for those in the Catholic tradition and the Christian traditions, and that is St. Paul reminds us in uh, his letter to the Corinthians, the first letter, that he says, I can understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but do not love but do not love, I am nothing. And that reminds us, for those that are Christian and, and believe these, these arguments, is that knowing these good reasons for belief in God is not now a, a reason to go out and try and beat someone down with logical arguments and say, you should believe because boom, 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 boom. But rather, we are called not to bombard people with logic and reason, but to bombard people with love. Our God is a God of love. Yes, he's logical, he's truthful, he's honest, all of those things, but he, he is a God of love and he calls us to love. And so if you're a Christian and you're watching this and you think these are great reasons I wanna tell someone, by all means tell them, but make sure that your interactions are always in love. With that said, I hope you've enjoyed this episode and may God bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.